So hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at this Your Overseas Home webinar. My name is Ryan and I'm a marketing manager here at Your Overseas Home. Um, today we'll be chatting with Ricardo Jesus from Chase Buchanan about your financial considerations you should think about when moving to Portugal. It's great to have you have so many of you here with us today, whether you're watching live or demand. Um, so Ricardo will go through his presentation and cover what uh, Chase Buchanan does and how they'll um, support your move to uh, Portugal. Once Ricardo has shared his presentation, they uh, will open the floor up to questions. So if you have any as we go along, please type them into your questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. We hope to answer as many queries as we can today, but if we don't get round to them all, please don't worry. Any answered, unanswered questions will be forwarded to Ricardo and his team at Chase Buchanan. So enough from me, so we um, get straight into it and I'll hand you over to Ricardo. Thank you, Ryan. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, as Ryan said, my name is Ricardo. Uh, I'm Portuguese and I work for Chase Buchanan as a, a private wealth manager. And today I'll be discussing uh, the financial and tax tips, essential bits that you need to consider before making a move to Portugal. Okay, so here's our agenda that I have for today. I'll be just introducing our company, kind of what we do uh, quickly in the beginning. And then the main points we're going to touch is, you know, what is the process before you leave the UK? Uh, as you are in the process of, you know, between the UK and Portugal, and then when you get to Portugal, the, the main things you need to be aware. Of course, we're just touching the surface at this stage, and we're available later on to discuss questions uh, at the end of the presentation, and then later on we we offer complimentary meetings to help you on a case by case basis. Okay, so starting with our company Chase Buchanan, here's just an overview of our structure. Um, to be clear, you see in the middle, historically, we, were, we are a UK company. It's, uh, we were created over 20 years ago, regulated by the FCA, as you can see in the middle. However, post-Brexit, uh, and as a lot of our clients were living in Europe, our FCA regulation or license would, doesn't cover those clients living in Europe. Therefore, we needed to expand into Europe, and we got the proper licenses to help our clients there. So we're licensed through the SISEC and the ICCS to offer our different solutions. MIFID is with investments, IDDs for insurance-based products, so we cover all the bases, okay? On the right side, uh, the far right is we also have a US department to assist uh, clients moving from the US to Europe. And as we have a lot of clients that move from different countries inside of Europe and the tax laws are different, we have a team of tax consultants that help and specialize into that those specific situations. Okay, so this kind of covers what we are our structure as a company. Uh, here's just you know because here's the locations where we are based, as most of our clients are in Portugal, Spain, Belgium, Canada, Cyprus, Malta, and still in the UK. Okay. Um, in terms of our services, you know we offer right we offer what you know, the normal IFA you could find in UK, we just, we help our clients manage their wealth with a financial and tax planning uh, and basis. Essentially, not only just manage the wealth, but consider the, the, the country you are and the financial and tax implications you also have in, in the different countries. One thing we're really proud of is, uh, as you can see on the far right, is a partnership that we have with the Metro Police in UK. Um, we actually help help them create this little booklet to help people prevent or manage just be aware of investment scams that are happening more and more uh, these days uh here, here this this charts or circle helps explain the type of the type of financial planning that we follow okay so step one kind of go together which we look to understand the current clients if in situation at the, the current client situation and establish what their objectives long term and short term are okay based on those two things what the client really needs are so we then develop a financial we analyze their financial situation and we put a plan together with several recommendations after that we implement that plan and we not only just implement implement that plan but we need to monitor and review that plan constantly to make sure that the objectives that we establish on step two 
we can actually help the client manage and achieve those objectives long term. Okay, so it's a six step process that we follow all the time. We are in Portugal, we have six, six advisors with different backgrounds and different experience across all of us. So we usually we can manage every single type of question. And we have partnerships with several uh, entities uh, in Portugal uh, as lawyers, accountants, real estate agents that we can pass you on to if you have questions that we do not know how to answer. So let's move into the actual essential things you need to be aware. So let's start with before leaving the UK. One of the main steps is if you're moving for a long period is putting your UK property on the market or, or rent out if you find that is a good opportunity. Okay. And you should do this before you make the move. Uh, as you're deciding to move to Portugal, you need to, these are the four types of visa that are more, most common. And you probably heard of these already. The golden visa is one that is not sure if it's going to end soon, but there's conversations that it may end soon. Uh, if you're buying a property above a certain level, usually half a million, you can get a, a golden visa to enter the country. Um, but you also have the D7. The D7 is if you have passive income that matches the minimum salary in Portugal, you're able to stay in the country. So those are the really the two easier ones and the most searched, uh, searched uh, types of visas. You also have the D2 and the D8. The D8 is more for digital nomads if you're working remotely, similar to the D7, uh, but it's a higher minimum income you need to show, okay? And the D2, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're starting a business, um, more on, on those bases, okay? The process starts from the UK you need to apply with the Portuguese embassy in the UK, okay? Usually it takes two, three months to get to a meeting with them. And after you go on a meeting and you get it accepted, you have 120 days initial entry um, to go into Portugal, and then you receive your residency card. You may take a little bit longer with Portugal to get your residency card, but you should get like a permit to <laughs> be able to stay in the country. Uh, approximately this, process takes around six months to complete considering the things from portugal you should expect a bit longer <laughs> um, if it helps you, you should get a removal quote to we partner with algarve removals to help you move from one country to the other and if you're exchanging money from once from one currency to the other smart currency really helpful as well Okay, so uh, looking at, you know, just the kind of the middle process, one thing is Brexit changed a lot of things, especially when it came to the residencies, uh, when, when it came to residency and the time that you are able to spend in Portugal. As it no longer belongs to Europe, uh, you, it belongs to the Schengen area, so you can stay 90 days out of every 180 without needing a visa, okay? But if you want to stay more than that, you need one of those visas that we mentioned before, which is different than before you had the free travel. Now you're restricted to these rules. Um, one of the main things you need to do right away when you're in the process of, in, when you're hard here in Portugal is get a NIF, which is a fiscal number and the Portuguese bank accounts. Here you see the get the passwords because this passwords, as you are now a non-EU, resident if coming from the uk you may need a fiscal representative and then when you get a nif you need to list an address that address should either is the fiscal representative's address or the address that you have in uk because this is important because the passwords to be able to access the online uh, portal will go to that address and that is really a key process a lot of people never are <laughs> Uh, move from the UK and then they list an address there and then the, the the letter goes there and they never come back and they it's just a really complicated process okay so take that in consideration one good thing about Portugal is there's no wealth tax and no inheritance tax and that's just Portuguese sides inheritance if it's given to direct family there's no inheritance okay if it's outside of family it's there's a, a stamp duty of 10 percent um, but it's different than UK inheritance tax. Even if you're living in Portugal, there is inheritance tax most likely from the UK sides, okay? Because you're 
classified as a as a domiciled UK as as UK domiciled, and that's really difficult and a really complicated conversation, complex conversation to have. And we can uh, speak more about that in the future. Um, again, one of the, the 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 final tips on this stage is do a lot of research, check these webinars, do some trips, get people to help you, like state agents, the lawyers, the accountants, financial advisors. Um, get a good trusting relationship with them because there's, I don't know, there's a lot of bad reputation, but there's really still good people around there that can really help you and make the process simple. Every single day I see cases of people that never really took advice and then it's really difficult to fix the issues that were done before. Focusing here on the property. So if you're buying a property in Portugal, take consideration of the taxes involved. So IMT is just the property tax and it can go from zero to eight percent this depends on the value of the property you're buying so if it's a for example a 300 300 000 property you should see around the four percent uh, property tax you also have stamp duty legal fees depending if you use your state agent as well which can go as high as five percent on average taking consideration on six percent just in taxes okay and this usually uh it's quite a quite a big amount depending on the amount of the value of the property you're buying okay so when you first arrive in portugal when during that 120 day period make sure you meet those professionals get a good relationship with them understand how they can actually help you um, and then look to secure your, pro your property at the moment in port in portugal there's not a very little supply and very high demand meaning the prices are Kind of going through the roof so it's really important that you make sure you get the property that you want because <laughs> probably tons of people waiting in line as well um a main consideration as well is nhr i'm sure you've heard of non-habitual residency the name is a bit tricky it has residency in the name but you should see it as a tax status it just gives tax benefits if you are a first-time resident in portugal and you should definitely take advantage of this, okay? And I'll explain a bit in a second. Uh, as a Portuguese resident, you have the benefit of using the national health system, um, and but you can also get private health, health insurance um, here as well, and it's way more affordable than in the UK. And again, just don't forget to apply sunscreen because today is just a strange day with no sun, but it's usually uh, 300 days of sun here in Portugal. Okay, so NHR, what is, since it's, it's uh, a tax status, if you are a first time resident, it gives you these benefits for 10 years. And instead of paying taxes at a Portuguese normal rate, uh, which can go very high very quickly, you get benefits on certain levels or on certain, certain types of income. So if you receive pension income, that's 10% during 10 years. If you have, if you receive foreign source dividends or interests, that's at zero percent. Okay, some countries need to check the double taxation agreements, but that's usually the case. If you're renting a property in the UK and you're receiving income from 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 that, if you are norm, if you were a normal Portuguese resident, you probably have to pay the difference because the UK would be technically usually cheaper or the tax would be lower, and you have to pay the difference. With the NHR nothing else here to pay you pay at source the property is in the uk the uk has the taxation rights and you pay nothing here in portugal if you have royalties it's the same zero percent if you're coming to work and you have one of the eligible professions and there's several there's a full full list uh you can either pay at marginal rates of tax or a flat fee of 20 percent you would, you would only choose to be a margin rate of tax if it's under 20%. But if it's higher than 20, you could just apply a flat fee of 20%, which is quite nice and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So some of the planning considerations while you're here, okay? If you're selling a property in the UK before Brexit, you could if you're selling a main residence, you could still benefit from reinvesting that capital gain or your main property proceeds into a Portuguese property and you could benefit from that, those exemptions. After Brexit, you have to pay the capital gains, okay? 
there's no it's the main residence or second property it, it's the same it's taxed the same way um this is something that changed recently so i just thought it was important to mention for some reason if you have a holiday home already in portugal and before there was different rules if you were a resident in portugal or non-resident it now changed and now it's the same thing for everybody 50 percent of the gain it's taxable at your marginal rate of tax so this the problem here is that not a problem but just something that puts a lot more work if you are a non-resident you have a house in portugal and you're selling that you have to declare your income in portugal so that we can portugal can assess what tax rate you're paying could be a bit painful and a lot of work to get this done so it's one good consideration to have in terms of your investments if you have an isa pep bonds in the uk those not those are not compliant in portugal meaning that like an ISA, the tax-free benefits that you're getting in the UK, if you are a Portuguese resident, no longer applicable. Most likely, on all the gains that you have from your ISA, you're going to have to pay capital capital gains at 28%. Okay, so before you move, consider, do study if it's the right decision. Most likely is to either sell or restructure into something that is compliant with Portugal um one of the the benefits by, by doing that if you're staying long term the capital gain tax instead of being 28 percent it can reduce to 11.2 depending on certain considered uh, certain situations but that is a really good benefit long term and here's the main problem after nhr as most of the the higher most of the probably the highest tax you pay during nhr is probably 20 percent then it would go from 14.5 up to 48%. And that is if you have, and you could go, the, the marginal rates is go from zero to 80,000. So someone that earns 50,000, 60,000 a year, which is normal for a, U, for a UK resident or UK national, in Portugal, they're paying probably 35 to 40% tax. And you're paying 20 before, and then after those 10 years, you're probably paying 40. So it's a really big hit if, you don't take the proper financial planning it could be a big hit with the proper financial planning you can reduce this and be more efficient okay um also have a uk and uh, portuguese will if you have portuguese assets uh up to date at all times with your pension okay um just check what type of scheme you have um because the taxes could be different um the U, most of the uk providers only are covered by the fca they don't have a license in europe so it may limit your access to financial advisor there okay um the different types of schemes are if it's a private scheme or a company scheme may be taxed differently okay they may, may be taxed at source or maybe taxed in portugal so it really depends so it's important to check that have a drawdown strategy during the nhr so your pension should be used during that nhr period again um because the taxation is lower okay uh if you keep your pension after of course with a state pension this does not it's not it's not the same uh, it's not applicable but if it's a private pension look to come up with a drawdown strategy during that nhr period the 25 percent tax-free allowance is only applicable as a uk resident if you move to portugal and you become a portuguese resident there's no tax 25 percent tax-free allowances anymore okay state pensions only taxable in portugal while some if it you have a sip or a private pension those could be taxed in the uk first okay so some differences there uh you can get the tax credit back there's a double taxation agreement so you don't pay it twice but uh, understand the differences it's really key and then depending on the the first thing i mentioned with a type of scheme there's a few options you could consider there's a QROPS, which is overseas pension there's also an international sip what it basically does is gives you some benefits that you may not have by um, by your previous uh, scheme before allows you for some consolidation you can keep your financial advisor give you some portfolio management also manage some currency pl uh, planning you can have uh, assets or investments in one currency and the other to do some sort of diversification so things to consider and with way more um, detail uh, further okay so in summary 
um, you have to take the right steps when you're leaving the UK. Okay, just uh, make sure you know what you're doing with your property. Check the type of pensions that you have. Uh, look at your investments, the ISIS especially. Look at the type of things they need to do before you leave. Um, because as soon as you, and this is really key, when you get to Portugal, on your NIF, as soon as you list your Portuguese address on your NIF, that could make you an automatic Portuguese tax resident. And, and then you're required to declare your income here in Portugal as well. Okay. In Portugal, it is important to understand your short-term, long-term objectives, just to make sure if, if Portugal is a place you're to stay for a few years, or if you're staying for your whole life for retirement. And the planning really changes on different, depending on your objectives. Take, you know, it takes time, it takes patience. It's not an easy process. So get professionals to help you um, do some of, some of the work, but choose the people that you trust. So yeah, hopefully I covered a lot of information in the short term, in this short period that we have. So now I'm just kind of open for some questions. Uh, so Ryan. Um, yeah, nice. Thank you very much for that, um, Ricardo. Was great. Some great insights there. So yeah, we've had some questions from the audience. So James has asked, is there any Portuguese tax liability on USA social security benefits if, if living in Portugal was less than 100 days per year? Sorry, there's a bit of a mouthful. I can repeat it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I, do. I, I missed. Uh, it's UK or US? So the, I'm, this is on US. So is there any US. Portuguese tax liability on US sec social security benefits if mm -hmm. living in Portugal was less than 180 days a year? The 180 days a year. So it the 180 days it's not really the key the key is whether you are a tax resident or not uh so if you are from the us and you're staying in portugal if you want to stay 180 days if you, say, well, if you want to stay more than 90 days out of every 180 you would need a visa and then if for example if it's a d7 there is a requirement that you register as a tax resident and then if you are considered a tax resident in portugal to benefit from the nhr then Yes, you have to pay tax, or not pay, but declare here in Portugal. With the US, it's a bit different. So on Social Security, you would pay in Portugal and you also have to declare in US. You never pay twice, you just depends on a rate. During an HR, you pay the 10%. If it's higher in the US, you pay the difference in US. If it's lower, you don't pay anything else. And then after an HR, same method. You just gotta see exactly who, you know, to what country do you owe what amount. Okay, nice. That makes uh, complete sense. If if it didn't cover your answer, obviously we can put you in touch with Ricardo after and we can we can go over more questions uh, yeah. there. So we've also had uh, a question from Philip. So this one seems quite complex as well. But um, so he's asking if he basically stays 180 days um, within one tax year, and then would be in Portugal the next um, the next year um for a similar amount of days and he's asking this is two separate tax years but both under 183 days in a calendar year does this mean that no tax returns are needed if yeah if you're just staying the required amount under the schengen rules you know less than 90 days out of every 180 you are just here on holiday you don't have to declare anything it's only if you breach those that schengen the schengen rules and if you, you know, if you're actually coming with a visa or you're looking to live here, that yeah, then yes. But if you're just as a, if you stay under the rules of the Schengen area, which gives you 90 days out of uh, every 180, no problem. It's just basically like you're here on holiday. Nice. Just be, be careful. Just sorry, one thing is just be careful if you're getting a NIF and even if you're staying three days, but on your NIF address, you put a Portuguese address then that would probably make you as a Portuguese tax resident. That's that's a really good, a really important consideration. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So next question just come in. So James has uh, just asked, I've read that EU is um, considering a wealth tax. Will that affect uh, Portugal residents? Um, 
could it could as at the moment i'm not i'm not sure to be honest i heard about that but i'm not sure if portugal will be could could be on on that but at the moment there's there's not and there's no wealth tax like in spain or france that you have the wealth tax but not in portugal at the moment okay um so yeah dan's just been really nice so thank you for the presentation it was really helpful and he's also asked um he works remotely from a us-based company if um if I qualify under NHR, do I owe any tax to PT? Uh, depends. Yes, if you're if you're living in Portugal and you have NHR, depends on your profession, but most likely yes, because you're living here, you're Portuguese tax resident, so it just really depends on how much income you're earning and if it's one of the eligible professions as well like I mentioned before. So um, if if your job is not performed from Portugal, you could get an exemption and you pay in the US and not in Portugal. But if it's assumed that the job is performed from Portugal, if you're working remotely, for example, uh, and it's one of the eligible professions, is at a flat fee of 20%, okay? Okay, yeah, that makes complete sense as well. Um, Philip has just continued um, uh, with, from that question about over 180 days. So he's he said we've already have a an F N I F um, mm -hmm. as we have a holiday rental property um, in in Portugal, and our tax returns are done by rep there. We uh, we have not been asked for a worldwide income yet. Is that correct? Uh, yes, unless you decide to sell. If you decide to sell your holiday home then is where for that year you have to declare your worldwide income so can port you don't have to it's not for you to pay tax uh, on your worldwide income it's just that portugal can assess what is the rate of uh of how you or when or just what rate you're going to pay on the capital gain so essentially is you sell your house you have 50% of the gain is taxable and they need to assess what is the marginal rate you're paying. So they need to access to your whole worldwide income. It's just so a calculation method. Okay, nice. I hope that answered your um, question, Philip. Um, Kate has also come in um, and just asked, when moving to Portugal, I understand that there is a time window for when I can bring my household possessions into the country without being taxed. Do you have any information on that? I don't. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, not sure. Not sure what she's talking about, to be honest. Okay, no worries. You've just been checkmated there, but hopefully we can follow up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please follow <laughs> up because I'm maybe I'm not seeing it at the moment. Um, okay. Don't know. <laughs> no worries. Hopefully that's not a consideration, and you don't need to worry. But yeah, that's all good. <laughs> so um, John has just asked: So EU citizens living in non-tax jurisdiction, not residents in Portugal yet, but in but earning income from property there, do I have to file a tax return in Portugal? Do you want me to repeat that? Does that make sense? So it's just so I can understand. So he's living in Portugal with the property overseas. Yeah. So he's an EU citizen living in a mm -hmm. non-tax jurisdiction not a resident in portugal yet but earning income from a property there do i have to file a tax return in portugal he's also said yeah. I've, I've obtained a, a, a nif and a bank account in portugal this year for the house purchase so if the house if your house is in portugal and you're living overseas yeah the rental income is but you're you're on a it's you may have to declare in Portugal as well because the house is in Portugal. Yeah, that's so, what he's asking. Do I have again, to file a tax return in Portugal because uh, he's living um, yeah. overseas? Again, yeah, again, the rates, it just really depends uh, on the double taxation agreement with that country. It just, you really have to look at the double taxation agreement. Most taxation double taxation agreements say the where the house is located that country has a taxation right so it really depends on what the, the agreement says because uk portugal say one thing france us is a different thing so it just really depends on what country and what is the double taxation agreement on rental income okay 
yeah, that that's sense. the main cons- that's the main consideration is every country they follow st- some sort of standard rules, but each country has their own set of or each partnership, let's say, has its own set of rules. It really just depends. That's you have to look at it and study and say, depending on where your income comes, where your residence, you then file in both sides and you pay on whoever has the um, the taxation rights. Okay. Yep. Um, so Robert has just asked a question as well. If you are an EU citizen and want to spend nine months a year in Portugal for the next 10 years, do I need a visa to stay? Um, no, it's, no, this is only a, the visas are just if you are uh, moving from a non-EU country. In the EU, there's the freedom of movement, so we don't technically need that visa. Yeah, only um, British people have missed out on that. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only if you are coming yeah. from the UK now, coming from the US, outside, yeah. in Australia, that's where you need a visa. Otherwise, you know, just freedom of movement, so you can come as any time as you want. Nice. Okay, so we're getting, we've had half an hour, but we've got a few more questions to answer. So we'll try and whiz through them so we don't keep everyone waiting. But John's mm-hmm. also asked, so when I move to Portugal, do I pay uh, PT tax on rental income from property outside Portugal during the 10-year NHR uh, period? No. If it's a property, again, it really depends on where the property is located, what country. If it's UK, like I was mentioning before, that rental income is paid in the UK and nothing further in Portugal during the NHR. That's the benefit of NHR. After the NHR, most likely the rate in Portugal is going to be higher than the UK. So the property is located in the UK. You pay, let's say, 20% in the UK and you have 28 liability here. You pay the 8% difference here in Portugal. That's after the NHR, of course. Yeah, that makes sense as well. So, uh, Darren, I'm pretty sure you've covered this, but just to, to put, uh, make it a bit more clearer for Darren, if you, he's yeah. asked, if you sell your property in Portugal and return funds to UK, what are the tax implications? If so, you know, if you're UK residents, no, I think I got it. If you're a UK resident and you have a holiday home in Portugal, uh, and if you sell the holiday home, if you sell that holiday home, yep. uh, 50% of the gain is taxable at the marginal rates of tax. It could go from 40, 14% to 48%. You have to declare how much you earn worldwide. So Portugal can assess what the rate is. You pay that in Portugal and you can bring the funds into the UK. No problem. You just pay the, what tax you own in, in Portugal and the remainings or the remaining come to Portugal, to come to the, to your bank account. Okay, nice. So that was a, a nice summary of, of, of that as well. So we, we'll, um, we've got time for one last question, actually. It's just a question about, so guys are asking, just for some quick information, um, he's asking if you are the person um, that would also, so he's asked, is Jesus the person that would also know about Spain and Cyprus? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you can reach out to me. I um, there we I have colleagues in Spain and I have colleagues in, in Cyprus. If you, we can have the first initial meeting, I just see what questions you have. I have a, a, a good understanding of how the rules work in different countries. But again, if you are living in those countries, Spain or Cyprus, I'll pass you on to one of my colleagues that had way more experience in that area. Uh, and they're actually there if you're actually moving to those locations. So the main thing I just, before we finish is, again, any sort of questions I was not able to answer today. Again, we offer complimentary meetings. My contacts are over there. Just send me an email, send me a WhatsApp message. I'll send you my Calendly calendar link, schedule a complimentary meeting. We go through your questions and we see how we can help you with the, the process of moving. And we usually for our clients are the touch or the first person they reach out to if they need access to other partners that we have like accountants lawyers people like that so just feel free perfect yeah that's a nice way to to end the presentation so yeah um thanks for um so that's all that we have time for today in today's session so thank you to ricardo for sharing your knowledge with us today and thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today it's been some great conversations and great questions. So yeah, we appreciate um, the support. We strongly recommend you get in touch with Chase Buchanan directly to discuss your requirements in detail, as Ricardo just mentioned. Um, we'll be in touch uh, with their details shortly. Um, 
But before we finish, um, we've had some really nice comments today in the section about um, the presentation being great. So uh, if you'd like to leave us a review um, on Trustpilot, if um, you found this webinar helpful, that would be really useful to us um, and obviously Ricardo. So thank you very much again um, and happy property hunting. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you go, Ricardo, and um, see you later, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye, guys.